Decade of America, presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. War and violence. And yet you burn with patriotism. You have the cold, analytical mind of a lawyer. British soldiers. Stragglers. Oh, Francis. Probably on their way to rejoin the fleet. Well, do you think there'll be any danger? That's most unlikely. They wouldn't dare to. Marlborough, a small town 16 miles from Washington, the British did dare. Who's there? Open up! Who are you? Is your name William Beans? I'm Dr. Beans. By what right do you break into my house? Put your clothes on. You get out of my house or I'll call the civil authorities. Civil authorities. This is war. We're taking you prisoner in the name of the king. But I'm a civilian, and I bear no arms against your king. It is said you're a very fierce man indeed, the way you treat our soldiers. If you're talking about the three British soldiers that I... I'm through talking, old man. How you do? Put your clothes on and we'll take you along right in your nightshirt. Where are you taking me? British headquarters. Get a move on. Enter, gentlemen. Well? Sir, I am Richard West of Upper Marlboro. And so is ours, sir. Yet we come as a delegation in behalf of our fellow townsman, Dr. William Beans. I presume you are acquainted with his case? Very well acquainted. The man has been charged with inflicting injury and humiliation on British troops. That, sir, is not true. You're wasting your time as well as mine. The man is charged with a serious offense. Dr. Beans is in no way connected with the war. Your soldiers had no right to invade his private property. There is no private property in a conquered nation. We are not a conquered nation, sir. Your troops have overrun Maryland and your fleet threatens our coast. But there is much more to America than this small section you hold by superior force. I am in no mood to listen to an impudent Yankee lecture. Your time is up, gentlemen. Your doctor, if he is one, will remain under lock and key aboard the vessel to which he's been transferred. Good day. Francis, we have a visitor from Upper Marlboro. In here, Richard. Well, now, this is a pleasant surprise. Welcome, Richard. How is your wife? Yes, how is my dear sister? She's fine, thank you. I sent her and the children to a safer place a month ago. These are unfortunate times, Francis. Yes, for every family in the nation. If Baltimore falls, Philadelphia will be next. Yes, if we only had more trained soldiers. Yes, but we don't. Only untrained militia. Poorly armed, without uniforms, without leaders. Who can blame them for running from the enemy as they did at Bladensburg? Well, tell me, Richard, what brings you from Upper Marlboro? I've been sent by the citizens of our town to enlist your professional help in a most delicate matter. I'm a lawyer, Richard. With Washington in a shambles and the courts closed, I'm afraid I can be of little help to anyone. Your reputation, Francis, isn't built solely on your success as a lawyer. You remember Dr. William Beans, who brought my two children into the world? Of course I do. One of my closest friends and a fine and honorable gentleman. And also a sick old man who has an excellent chance of dying in the filthy hold of a British prison ship. Oh, no. That's why I'm here. The people of Upper Marlboro feel that, with all the obstacles, you are the man best qualified to save Dr. Beans. It may be dangerous. 
Will you do it, Francis? How can I refuse? But Francis... Mr. Key, Mr. President, I regret I cannot receive you in the executive mansion, but only the British burned it. I trust you were able to save some articles, Mr. President. Well, my wife managed to load the Gilbert Stewart portrait of General Washington and some of the silver into the carriage before she fled. There will be a better day in God's good time, sir. I subscribe fully to that sentiment, Mr. Key. Now, with regard to your proposal to venture into the den of the British lion in search of... Uh, Dr. William Beans, have you given proper consideration to the personal risks involved? Frankly, sir, I'm much more concerned with the proper method of finding the British lion. And just how do you propose to go about it? If it meets with your approval, Mr. President, I shall ask General Mason for the use of the small packet boat in service at Baltimore. In this small boat, you'd sail in search of the British fleet? I must find them, sir, to appear before General Ross and the admirals. Well, I must remind you that we're at war, a serious and bloody war. The moment the enemy sees you, he'd very likely open fire. The packet boat carries a flag of truce, sir. Which might be impossible to distinguish in the misty stretches of Chesapeake Bay. I'll take the chance, sir. Mr. Key, I have been informed that you have a wife and family. You should think of them. I am, sir. Of all the wives and families who have suffered when a loved one is taken from them unjustly. In the case of Dr. Beans, the rights of but one man have been trampled on. Injustice to one man, sir, is injustice to a nation created to protect the rights of all men. This country of ours is made up of individual men, and each is entitled to the protection we guarantee to all. I ask your permission and authorization, Mr. President, to go to the enemy as your special emissary, to do all I can, with God's help, to secure the release of Dr. Beans. Mr. Key, you have a talent with words. May you plead as well before the British as you have with me. Francis, I didn't expect you home so soon. Well, Mr. Madison was most helpful, my dear. I'm to meet a young man named Skinner in Baltimore tomorrow. You were successful, Francis? In Washington, yes. But there's one task still unaccomplished. What's that? To find the British fleet. You're going to the British fleet? Well, after all, we can't expect Admiral Cochrane and General Ross to come to me. Yes, but getting there, Francis. General Mason is providing a small boat, and his flag officer is accompanying me. It sounds very dangerous. Oh, not at all. We'll be carrying a flag of truce. I know you two have much to say before you leave. Thank you, Richard. Goodbye. Goodbye, Richard. Francis. Yes, Polly? I don't want you to go. Now, you don't really mean that. I do mean it. I'm afraid. That's not like you, Polly. You out there in a little boat that the British guns could blow right out of the water. But I told you we'll be carrying a flag of truce. Would a flag of truce mean anything to men who burn cities, drive people out of their homes, and imprison a helpless old doctor? Come, now you're forgetting your scriptures. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And I love you so very much. Yeah, now that's better. I wish I could go with you. But I'll be back in no time. Polly. Sailing on the Chesapeake, Polly and me. No sign of the British. Oh, where can they be? I love your poems. The silly one best of all. Sing me another. <laughs> oh, you've made my mind a blank. But have you heard this one they've been singing in the taverns in Baltimore? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's called To Anacreon in Heaven. Anacreon was an old Greek god. To Anacreon in Heaven, as he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition. Like looking for a needle in a haystack. We'll 
never find them, John. When? When? We've been groping through this fog for two days. Yet we know the British fleet is somewhere out there. Helmsman? Aye, sir. Set your course toward the mouth of the Potomac. I will hold course to northeast. May up with this fog lift and it'll set us right. shallows above Fort McHenry, and for that reason I shall shift my flag to the surprise. You, Coburn, will bring the fleet as close as you can, while Sir Robert attacks by land. We'll have supper that night in Baltimore, my lord. It is my plan to land inside North Point, ten miles from Fort McHenry. You know the country, Sir Robert. Like the palm of my hand, my lord. Come in. Yes, Lieutenant? A Yankee packet ship bearing a flag of truce has come alongside, my lord. What's that? There are two gentlemen aboard who claim to be emissaries of President Madison. Oh, they're ready to surrender Baltimore, right, I vow. You may bring them in, Lieutenant. Mr. Francis Scott Key and Mr. John S. Skinner, emissaries of the President of the United States. I am Key, sir. Do I have the honor of addressing Admiral Cochran? You do, sir. My associate, Mr. Skinner. <laughs> Admiral Coburn, General Rush. You're invited to be seated, gentlemen. Thank you. We prefer to stand. Our business is brief. We are here, sir, on behalf of Dr. William Beans. That old traitor? You slander an innocent man, sir. Mr. Skinner means no insult, Admiral Coburn. But he is correct in saying that Dr. Beans is an innocent man. Yankee presumption at its best. You recall the case, my lord. They had some of our soldiers arrested by civilian authorities. You are familiar with the incident, Sir Robert? I am. And I will listen to no plea for a man who acted hostilely towards British soldiers. The old man ought to be hanged. And well, he might be, for he'll be taken to Halifax for trial. Which, I must remind you, sir, constitutes the illegal removal of a non-combatant to a foreign land where he could not possibly receive unprejudiced treatment. Bah! I suggest, my lord, that these two scoundrels would look well in a cell next to their Dr. Beans. Is that the treatment of... Admiral Cochran, we did not come here to quarrel, but to acquaint you and General Ross with certain facts we do not think you are aware of. We have more important matters before us, Mr. Key. I must ask you to return. There is one, sir, a reason so vital that even a vice admiral of the British Navy dare not ignore it. Dare not, Mr. Key? Dr. Beans has never been brought before either a military or a civil court. With your permission, I shall quote, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or disguised or outlawed or banished unless by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. What's he saying, my lord? Magna Carta. You plead well, Mr. Keene. Continue. Dr. Beans is a scholar and a gentleman of unimpeachable character, highly esteemed by the people of the community. On the day before his arrest, he was giving a small party to friends in his garden when several of your soldiers, returning to the fleet after the burning of Washington City, trespassed on his property on Upper Marlboro demanding spiritous liquors and threatening bodily harm to the doctor and his guests if their demands were not met. As you or anyone else would have done under the circumstances, sir, Dr. Bean summoned the assistance of the local authorities, who arrested the soldiers and lodged them in jail until they were fit to travel on the road and rejoin their comrades. One of these reported the incident falsely, and as a result, your Marines were sent to arrest the doctor. That they broke in the door of his house, dragged him from his bed, and carried him against his will to a military camp from which he was transferred to the brig of a ship. Fine words, fine phrases, but meaningless. Is any of this true, Sir Robert? I have not examined the records carefully, my lord. I only know that Dr. Beans is accused of inflicting injury and humiliation upon British troops. In that case, General Ross, I suggested that you examine these letters. Letters? Letters written by British officers held by us as prisoners of war. They are addressed to their comrades here in the fleet. Another Yankee trick. I'm sure you'll recognize some of the signatures. 
What do these letters have to do with Dr. Beans? As a military commander, I assume, sir, that you have concern for your sick and wounded? Obviously. And they receive the best of care. But what about your sick and wounded who have fallen into the hands of the enemy? Well, they are prisoners of war, Mr. Key. We expect them to get humanitarian attention. But we hope and pray they are treated with kindness and gentleness as well. Now, sir, just what has all this to do with Dr. Beans? I suggest you read the letter, sir. same tenor and of the same impulse selfishly of their time in making the vast sick and wounded an easier one. Are these letters genuine, Sir Robert? Unquestionably. And perhaps you have a new recommendation concerning Dr. Beans. I have, my lord. I feel myself bound to make a return for the kindness shown to my sick and wounded officers. And upon that ground, and that only, I would be quite willing to release him. Then we may take him with us tonight. Oh, patience, Mr. Key. In making this impetuous visit to the British fleet, you have forgotten one thing, the war. You and your associate have had ample opportunity of noting our position, to see something of our strength, perhaps even to become acquainted with a portion of our plans. We wouldn't like this information to get back to your military forces. Then we are prisoners. Let us say our guests. You will return to your package ship with Dr. Beans and remain at anchor a few miles away. Then you may be sure that if you raise sail and try to slip away, we'll open your bilge with round shot. But I don't understand. You will, Mr. Key. You will. When our bombs begin bursting over Fort McHenry. You feeling better, Dr. Beans? Freedom is an invigorating tonic, Mr. Key. A few days and you'll be back in Upper Marlboro, sir. Thanks to you and Skinner. Thanks to the power that led and strengthened us, sir. British fire is growing heavier. Are we replying? Yes, but the shells from Fort McHenry are falling short. Save our nation from destruction. O oh, Jehovah, God of battles, strengthen the weak in thy name. Keep our flag flying through the mists that would engulf him. Amen. Can you see the flag? The flag, it's still there! What, Francis? What is it? The inspiration of this moment. I feel it so deeply, I must put it into words. Let me see. Oh, say, can you see? And so the tattered flag continued to fly over Fort McHenry until the British, repulsed both by land and sea, retired from the scene of battle, leaving Dr. William Beans and his rescuer, Francis Scott Key, free to return to Baltimore. It must have been a distressingly trying 10 days. Uh, how is Dr. Beans? Well, I think that when we saw the British fleet sailing down the bay and heading for home, he recovered completely. Thank God Fort McHenry held out, and our militia saved Baltimore. Judge Nicholson? Oh. Your servant, sir. And is this your talented brother-in-law, Mr. Key? Ferdinand Durang, one of our militia, and a great singer, Francis. A pleasure, sir. My pleasure, sir. Like everyone in Baltimore, I've been reading your inspired poem in The Patriot, Mr. Key. I understand The Patriot had handbills struck off and distributed all over the city. It should be set to music. Isn't there a melody it could be sung to, Mr. Key? Well, the night I left home, I was singing to my wife. Perhaps you'll remember the old air, Mr. Durang. To an Acreon in heaven, I was thinking of it. I see. <laughs> yes, it does fit. Ferdinand, sing it. Oh, say, can you see? 
by the dawn's early light. What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Shore dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foes hardly host in dread silence reposes. What is that which the breeze or the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, half conceals, half discloses? Now it catches the of the morning's first beam in full glory reflected now shines on the stream tis a star-spangled banner oh long may it wave for the land of the free and the Francis Scott Key, the man who wrote it, and Ferdinand Durang, who first sang it. But later, in 1931, that a bill was enacted by the 71st Congress, whereby the composition, The Star-Spangled Banner, was designated as the National Anthem. enjoyed our story and will be with us when the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware again presents The Cavalcade of America.